Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Virgin Stars podcast. Oh, my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Jeff Coopwood boards the mothership. He's an accomplished theater and film actor, voice actor, and opera singer. You know him as the voice of the Borg in Star Trek First Contact. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Coopwood. Thank you so much for coming to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Mr. Coopwood is my dad. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just I'll call- Jeff and you're a Jeff, so we're just going to Jeff bond here for a little while. I'll call you Jeff too. <laughs> Works for me. Well, you can call me Jeff one because you you won't be talking to yourself. So, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> so, so we'll just both call each other Jeff, and I think we'll be fine. But but I do appreciate how good your name is, though. Now, there you go. exactly. Now, do you know what it means? <laughs> well, please tell me. Well, I was uh, well, I was going to ask you if you knew, because otherwise I won't bother you or your audience with 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 the information. I, you know what what Jeff comes from? Please tell me. All right. So first, if we're going to do it, then I have to do it properly. Now, do you spell yours E-R-Y or R-E-Y? R-E-Y. Well, then you can stay. Okay, that's very good. <laughs> it just shows you have literate parents. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> no, so, so Jeffrey, as I understand it, comes from Joffrey, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y, um, which comes from Godfrey. If you're old enough, you might remember the old actor Godfrey Cambridge. If not, you can always Google him. And Godfrey comes from the Gaelic for God's peace. Peace as in P-E-A-C-E, not P-I-E-C-E. Mm. You know, just to be clear, not trying to be God's <laughs> peace. You understand? Just yeah. God's peace. And that's what I've what I've learned over the years is where it comes from. So if you did not know that, I will bill you separately. <laughs> so do, do you hold true to that? Are you a peaceful individual? It depends on how we're doing there, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 can, I, will, I make no promises in advance, you know? So. I will tread lightly. <laughs> nah, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. <laughs> so I always start off with the question of inspiration. So what inspired sure. your love of acting? Who are your earliest influences? Well, there's an interesting question. Okay. Um, so... I can tell you when I first figured out it was something that I might want to do. How about that? Okay. Um, So uh, I am the product of two parents who were radio, who were both uh, radio broadcasters, not together, but separately. And um, so with that in mind, I had a notion of the fact that you can actually get paid to perform, you know, make a living out of it. And uh, so um, my, my mom's uh, radio show was during the day. Uh, and at the time, my grandmother lived with us. So she was my babysitter while my mother was on the air working. And as grandmothers will do, or at least did back in those days, you know, uh, the, the main source of entertainment was soap operas on television during the day, right? So I've forgotten the soap opera uh, all these years later, but uh, whatever it was, there was a kid on there who was about my age, uh, as I said, I was about seven, and uh, he was a regular on on the soap, and and every single scene, he was um, laughing, joking, interacting with the adults, being treated like an equal, and uh, I thought, okay, well, then that's kind of cool, and so I was attracted to the soap just because I saw a kindred you know, a kindred spirit on, on the soap. And then um, my mother, we were living in Chicago at the time um, and my folks had divorced early, but my mother got a radio job uh, in Texas from Chicago. And we ended up driving from Chicago to Texas. It's a long winded answer, but I'm coming around the bend here for you. So um, bear with me. So we got to Texas, and the first thing we did when we settled in our in our new home was, you know, turned on the television, saw the soap opera, same soap opera, same mm. kid, 
And that was the first time I understood the fact that I asked my mother about it. I said, so this is the same soap opera that was on, you know, back home in Chicago. And, and she said, yeah, some programs are, are, I mean, you know, my program is local, some programs are national. So I was like, so wait a second. So this kid's kind of like seen all over the place and he's kind of famous, right? <laughs> and she said, yeah. Uh, she said, I guess so. And I said, and he's getting paid for that, right? And she says, <laughs> yeah. And I said, all right, I think I know what I want to do. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was, that was how, that was how it started. Um, so by then, I think I was eight. Sure enough, uh, she got another radio opportunity after a year in Texas. She got two, in fact. She got one offer in Los Angeles, and she got another offer in Miami. Um, and so uh, she asked me, the eight-year-old at the time, so uh, I've got these two offers now, one L.A. and one Miami. Which one should I go to? And I said, well, let's go to Los Angeles. And she said, great, because we're going to Miami. So, um, <laughs> well, you know, an, an eight-year-old may get a vote, but it's never going to be a majority vote, right? So, mm. so we ended up in Miami. And around the time that I was uh, from eight to about 10, I started pestering her because I couldn't get this, this bug out of my head that that's what I wanted to do. But I understood that I needed to be trained. So uh, I started pestering her for acting class, acting classes, acting lessons, acting something. And that was a two year campaign that I launched while we were in Miami from ages eight to 10 until she finally relented at age 10. Um, where I, where she got me into some acting classes. And, uh, you know, I got the, I, I got bit by the bug officially and it's kind of sort of what I've been doing ever since. So when you told her you got bit by that bug, someone who has had, cause she's had experience in entertainment with broadcasting. What advice did she give you? Was it like back up, have a backup plan or was it congratulations? You're one of us. Well, I should also tell you that my mother herself was a former actress. Mm. So, uh, she was an actress. She had been a model. <clears throat> um, and uh, so she kind of sort of sort of understood what I was interested in doing. And um, I, 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 my recollection is that she was very encouraging. She just said, like any good parent would, um, you know, this is a hard industry that you're trying to get into. So make sure you have a backup plan, mm. um, which I did. <clears throat> I, I didn't at the time. But by the time I got to college, um, I was one of those folks who had uh, a minor and as I recall I had something ridiculous like 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 three or four or I mean a, a major which was theater and then I had like like uh, I think something ridiculous like five minors oh, <laughs> because I had to have something to fall back on right I think I had one in journalism one in broadcasting one in in, in music applied voice because I was also a singer um one in uh, uh, I can't even remember what the others were, but they were all sister disciplines. Um, so, uh, you know, that was, that was, oh, one in creative writing was one and I forgotten what the other one was, but in any event, so, so, but it worked out. Oh, and another one was in English, um, and, which I think you can uh, relate to because I know you're an English teacher. Indeed. So, <laughs> yeah, I did my homework too. We should talk about that as well. Um, <laughs> but so, but, but it worked out because, uh, at different points in my life when, you know, I was pursuing the craft, but still needed to pay the rent. Um, I had things to fall back on. And those minors all at, 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 at different points in my life, each one of those minors served its purpose and got me the survival gigs that I needed to keep going. So, well, yeah, it well, worked I, out well. well, I read that you sang with the, the, the Miami Opera for four seasons. Well, that's what you get for reading uh, Wikipedia. That's um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's actually it's actually true. Uh, that's very true. Um, yeah. So what do you want to know about that? So what was the experience like and how did those skills as a singer help you? Because I know you do a lot of voice work. Does yeah. singing opera help you with the voice work later? Um, that's an interesting question. I have to think about that. Um, well, all right. Um, I can tell you that a good part of my career has been to use, uh, you know, whatever vocal instrument, you know, I was given. And like I said, coming from two broadcasters. I came by some things naturally, um, but I was also uh, in high school. I was on the uh, speech and debate team um, and that helped. And then I subsequently went on and coached on the high school and college level. Um, and uh, that of course helped. 
and um, I sang because you know that's what that's what kids do. And I was a, uh, and I and I probably should not confess this publicly, but I was like <laughs> one of those movie musical geeks from back in the day. <laughs> yeah, when there were actual movie musicals. Um, um, I, I I don't know how old you are, Jeff, but um, uh, I suspect that I'm older than you, as I am older than most people. But um, <laughs> Um, uh, there was this musical that, that came out, uh, I think I was about oh, 10 or 11 at that time. And it was, uh, remember the King and I with Yul yes. Brenner? Yeah. All right. So, uh, that, that, that was, I think my first television, it, it, it aired on TV. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was like, you know, this is the best thing ever, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, side note, which is an embarrassing side note, but I've gone, might as well go for it. I'm in for penny in for a pound. Right. So, yep. um, I think my mother, I, I saw the movie, you know, and it was King and I, and I'm like, how cool is this? And then by pure coincidence, uh, I want to say a few days later, my mother brought a kitten home, uh, for us. And it was a Siamese cat. Now I had just seen King and I, right? So I've got, you know, Siam, Siamese, Thailand, all that in my head. Mm -hmm. So she says, you can name this cat. And I remember Yul Brenner, you know, and, and Prince Chula Longcorn, I think was the character's name, his son's name and all that. So mm. I said, okay, great. So I'm going to name, I'm going to name the Siamese cat. Um, we're going to call him uh, Lord Frederick of Siam. <laughs> Very cool. No, it was just sad. It was just sad <laughs> and wrong. Don't encourage me. Luckily, you know, years of therapy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, you know, in a 10 year old's mind from just having watched King and I, I thought, how cool is this Siamese cat? Give him a royal name because, you know, cats have attitude to begin with and Siamese cats even more so. They have this regal bearing. So I couldn't just call him Mutt. I had to give him a name. Right. <laughs> so so Lord Frederick of, of Siam. And my mother thought that was just the, the strangest thing in, ever. But, you know, she was indulgent. So uh, the problem was that uh, I would call the, the cat and the cat would leave the room. I would say, Lord Fred, oh, there he goes again. You know, he'd leave the room. Never got the whole sentence of the whole Fred, Lord Fred, oh, there he goes again. You know, he's sitting down. People, hey, come here, Lord Fred. Oh, there he goes again. <laughs> so finally the cat was, I was, and I, I was frustrated with it. And I expressed to my mother, I was like, I, I can't get this cat to stay in the room long enough to learn its name. So she said, well, you know, maybe that's because, you know, you're, that name is a little intense and maybe the cat's trying to tell you something, Jeff. And I'm like, OK, what am I going to do? And she said, well, I don't know if you want my advice, but when I was your age, my, uh, you know, my folks brought a cat home and uh, told me I could name it. And I named it Butch. And I said, Butch, what kind of name is Butch for a cat? And she says, I don't know. Let's try. So she calls the cat. She says, Butch. And the cat came and jumped in her lap. <laughs> So from that point on, the cat became Butch. Okay, <laughs> it could have been Lord Frederick of Siam, but the damn thing ended up as Butch, and it's not from my lack of trying. But anyway, so so but but uh, so the King and I became uh, the first movie musical that uh, you know I was hooked latched onto, and then a second one in relatively short order, as I recall, was the the musical Oliver, based on mm. the the the. The, uh, the 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 Dickensian, yep. you know, uh, Oliver Twist story, and mm -hmm. that was a movie musical too. And once again, uh, the Oliver, the the young kid that playing Oliver, was the same age as I was uh, at the time. I think he was ten or eleven or something. So once again, I'm like, oh, see, once again, you know, here's a kid doing, you know, the same thing that I want to do. So I was I was just I was hooked. So um, that's kind of sort of how the singing started. Because I found myself, you know, singing along with the musicals on TV. And of course, we had to buy the albums. And then like any kid, I'm singing along with the albums. But while I was singing along with, you know, the Beatles and everything else that was contemporary at the time, I was also singing along with movie, with movie musicals. So, and the way the opera thing happened, to, 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 to just bring that to full circle. So, um, my mother's radio show um, was um, in, in Texas. It was a gospel show. When she took the job in Miami, it became a talk show, but she still had a large collection of gospel albums from her from her Texas radio show. Uh, but somewhere buried in among all of those was an album uh, of La Traviata, the Verdi music, the Verdi opera. Um, but it was, as, as I recall, it was like a four album set. It was a long, you know, three act opera. 
And, but only one of the four albums remained. God knows where the other three went. But I played the grooves off of that one until it couldn't play anymore. And I'm singing along with the opera. And I didn't know from tenor, from baritone, from soprano alto, I didn't care. It was music and I'm singing along, you know, all the more reason why the cat probably left the room whenever <laughs> I began to speak. But so, so the opera thing happened. And as it turned out, that ended up being fortuitous because fast forward to, uh, I want to say my senior year of high school, um, you know, I've, I had done by that point, you know, high school theater, uh, my senior year, I had transferred, in fact, from a different high school, my junior year, because that program, that high school was a smaller private school, did not have a theater program. Um, and I transferred not for theater, I transferred uh, for speech and debate, because I had a debate partner who was um, uh, a year older than I was, and we had won state and gone to the national finals, uh, championships, whatever, and um, but he graduated and I wanted to debate again my senior year, but I didn't have anyone at that school that was at the same level that he was. And I went to a summer institute um, and discovered that there was a, a, a debater from one of our rival schools who was my same age and it was in the same situation. His, his, his partner, you debate in teams of two. So his partner uh, had also graduated. So he was looking for a partner. I was looking for a partner. And we discussed whether or not he was going to, uh, we decided to debate together. So we were, you know, talking about whether he should transfer to my school or if I should transfer to his. But decided to transfer to his. And that one had a, 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 a terrific theater program with a theater teacher who is to this day a mentor of mine, God lover. Um, who basically changed my life. But, but so um, the theater thing evolved from there. And this to put a, a tiny bow on your question about the opera thing. So the local, the local opera association, this was Miami, uh, down in Miami, by the way, uh, the local opera association got a, a grant to go and like do an operetta at like the local schools, um, you know, to expose kids to, to opera. And uh, so they came to our school and they did this little 45 minute operetta. And um, um, I, I've forgotten which one it was. I want, it might've been a mall and the night visitors or something, but I think it's, it was another one I've forgotten in any event. So, um, and being the cocky kid that I was, surprise, surprise. <laughs> so I went backstage um, and all it was, was like a little opera troupe of like maybe six singers and a pianist. And I went backstage after it was over and introduced myself to the pianist and, you know, said, gee, that was totally fun. You know, um, that was nice. I had a good time. He goes, great. Are, are, do you sing? And I said, I sing because I'm in the chorus here at school. Um, I'm also in, you know, the plays because I'm, 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 I'm in theater. But also just just I have to tell you, too, that I sing some opera. He said, oh, you do. And I told him, yeah, I have this album at home and from La Traviata. And he goes, oh, really? He goes, do you know anything from it? And so I began to sing uh, the one thing that I remembered from it, which was the baritone aria. If any of your listeners are opera files, they'll know uh, the opera Di Provenza Omar from uh, Traviata, which the father sings, and it's a beautiful little baritone thing. So I, I said, I know that. Well, this guy begins to play it. <laughs> just no sheet music, just, you know, whatever, uh, you know, just begins to play it from memory. And I sang along. Uh, and we got to about through the first verse before he stopped me. And I thought I had, you know, um, you know, made an entire fool of myself. And he said, I think you should audition for the Opera Association. You should come in and audition. And I said, you're kidding, right? And he said, uh, no, I'm very serious. And I'm like, well, how would we even make that happen? You know, I don't know anybody. I've never, I don't read music. I, you know, I don't know opera, really. I mean, I know this one album. I know this one aria. You know, who would I talk to? And he said, well, you're, you're talking to the person you need to talk to because I'm the <laughs> associate conductor for the Opera Association. I thought he was just the guy playing the piano. He was the associate conductor. Mm. And he was the head of the chorus. So he said, you'd come in and you'd basically audition for me. I'm like, well, I just did that. I, I didn't even realize I just auditioned. He said, yeah, well, come in and you know, bring some more music and whatever. Sure enough, I did. Um, and they signed me. And I think I was the youngest person they'd ever signed to a pro professional contract. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, it was an amazing experience. I was there throughout the four years uh, that I was in uh, college. 
uh, this was high school. I graduated, you know, by the time I started their, their, their next season, it was my freshman year of college. And um, Miami, Miami Opera at the time, it was, it's now Florida Opera, but at the time it was Greater Miami Opera Association. There are no small shakes. At the time, they were like a top 10, top 15 opera company. And in fact, they are the opera company where Luciano Pavarotti made his American debut. Mm. A lot of folks think it was Chicago or the Met or whatever, but it was actually Miami. Um, and uh, he uh, um, became so enamored of this place because they treated him so well when he was still starting out in a nobody that he made a point to come back and do at least one production there every year that he continued to sing. So he not only, you know, uh, is someone that I shared the stage with. Um, but he's someone who I became, uh, got to know as a, on a personal level as a, as a friend, because he would go every year, he'd come every year, and it was like, we were all, you know, everybody knew Luciano, so, you know, having an opportunity to sing with folks like, you know, Pavarotti, and, and Plato Domingo, and uh, Leontine Price came to town, Margaret Price came to town, um, you know, um, some, some, some of the, like, the luminaries, the international luminaries of the day in opera, like these legendary voices, and me being a college kid and, and sharing the stage with them and getting to watch and learn was extraordinary. It was an absolutely extraordinary experience. Got to do uh, Boris Gudinov with Cesare Siepe, got to do John um, uh, Otello with, with, or, or Othello with John Vickers. These are the, these, both of these guys were folks who were at the top of their craft, who were considered like the premier, uh, the best uh, at that particular, at those particular roles at the time. And here I was, you know, and uh, Pop Roddy, of course, I don't have to tell you. So, mm. um, you know, to sit there and to watch those folks, you know, every night was a masterclass that they actually paid me to take. So it was a great experience. So, um, and, it, and it came in handy, you know, obviously, when I started um, doing professional theater, once I graduated. Yes. Yeah, I mean, my knowledge of opera is kind of Bugs Bunny and Looney Tunes, unfortunately. Listen, that's a, listen, kill the wabbit, right? Kill the right. wabbit. Listen, that's how we all started, pretty much. So God, God love Looney Tunes because that's Indeed. how we all started. So, um, I mean, there is performance acting to a opera. It's not just the singing. Am I correct on that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they're singers first, though, and they'll let you know that. They're singers first and actors second. But also, you know, my background was musical theater um before you know before the opera thing opera opera was a lovely check but i was a student not for opera i was a student for musical theater and of course they're the priority is the opposite it's acting first and singing second but you got to be able to do both um but yeah um we we would always joke about the singers who were clearly just singers mm. and 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 really god awful actors um not so much <laughs> now as then but there were we had some we had some great stories that we always enjoyed telling about some of the folks who came in and these were some of the world's best opera singers but to watch them try to act was just beyond painful is the approach to acting in opera the same as regular theater acting absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not absolutely not no opera opera is bigger grander um um massive and um as i say the voices are the primary reason you're hired hmm. so uh uh the acting is frequently um over the top and not real, not real acting, not even musical theater acting, which can sometimes also be a little cartoonish mm. um, and certainly not legitimate, you know, or should, I should say straight theater acting. Uh, very, very different. Um, very, very different. I mean, you have to learn as an actor, as a stage actor, you learn um, very early on that you've got to play to the balcony. You know, so you've got to be able to project, mm. you know, hopefully you're you're in a theater uh, that's got good acoustics or is or has got a good um, audio system. And so you you're wearing a body mic as well as their general area mics, you know, on the stage. But I got to tell you that for opera, by contrast, um, there are no microphones, at least oh, there wow. they, they used to be. So so when you're singing, you have to project to the cheap seats. <laughs> and so so, you know, the nosebleed section across the street, the folks, you know, that are, that, that are looking at you, you know, through binoculars because they're so far away, they've got to be able to hear you and they've got to be able to hear you over an 80 piece orchestra <laughs> that's, that's playing its guts out. Oh, my so, God. <clears throat> it is it is it is a vocally um, taxing experience. It is it is it is, you know, and. and and to be able to project beyond all that, even, even if you're singing softly, to still be heard, 
that's the skill that's the craft but at the, all, also at the end of the day that's the job mm. so you learn how to do that so if you have never seen uh an opera jeff i would encourage you to do it um even if you don't um physically make it out to see one which you really should because kind of sort of like that's the only way you really get to take it all in um is to see is to experience it live it's just like live theater you know you can you can watch it you can watch it on your tv screen mm. uh, or you can you know like be in the theater and to be in the theater is the experience then there's nothing like that so um but but if you can't for whatever reason get to a, a great opera company a, a great production anywhere near you go on go on youtube you were just talking about youtube we were talking about youtube before you know we we started talking there are complete operas on youtube uh not just from the metropolitan opera but from opera companies all across the world and there is not um a major opera that doesn't have at least you know it doesn't have at least a handful of complete productions on youtube it's a great resource i wish it was around when i was younger you know thousands of days ago when, <laughs> you know, when dinosaurs still roamed so now does phantom the opera count as watching an opera um that's an interesting one uh, that's a really interesting one because phantom of the opera is a music is is a bit of musical theater however um, it requires operatic voices to, to do it well, mm. just like Les Miserables does. So there are some, so there are some uh, pieces of musical theater that are that require we call them legit voices. There's musical theater voices where you basically, you know, you're, you're you're belting, and then there's legit voices where you know you're using your instrument very differently, and it's got to have a different kind of sound to it. So um, so it's not really an opera, but I would argue um that it's kind of sort of like a light opera because yeah it's it's you, you got to be able to have those pipes if you've ever heard uh, a phantom um and you've ever heard um uh, um like the soprano uh she hits notes that are legit you know um you know she she's up there she's a legit soprano otherwise she can't do that role so you will find that a lot of singers who have done phantom or who have done les mis are singers are actor singers with with operatic backgrounds some operatic experience certainly some legit vocal training versus you know jazz vocal training you know what i'm saying or, or some other genre but yeah legit vocal training is required for those roles so yeah um it's 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 as close as um it's as close of a hybrid of opera as musical theater as it can get um, yeah. And, and in fact, if recollection serves, I think there are some smaller opera companies uh, that have even tried to do some musical theater productions because, because they're close enough, like the, the, the Les Mises, or even like a Sweeney Todd, for example, um, you know, or, or, or like we're talking about Phantom of the Opera. So yeah, there's, there, there's, there, there, there are definitely sister disciplines, but there are some differences. So for our novice listeners who don't know opera, which um, show should we be looking for? Okay, I will tell you what I remember telling an ex of mine who, who posed that same question years, <laughs> years ago. She said, she said, I know you did opera <clears throat> and I've never seen one. So for the first opera that I go to, what should it be? And um, without hesitation, I'll told, I told her what I will tell you. Go see Aida. Go see a production of Aida. Okay. Um, go even on uh, YouTube and find a production of Aida. And I'll tell you why. Because Aida has everything but the kitchen sink. Uh, Aida has a massive orchestra, a massive chorus, massive number of extras on stage, people who literally go across the stage and do nothing but carry a spear. There's soldiers marching in, in a procession, live animals, anything from elephants to horses to camels. Um, and, and it takes place in ancient Egypt. So you've got like sets that, that are, you know, like, look like, like, like the temple of Isis or the pyramids. So they're like three, four, three, four story tall sets. So it's a massive, massive, like, like, like Ben-Hur, Cecil B. DeMille cast of thousands kind of opera. So if you've never seen, and plus the music is just glorious. Um, so I would say, um, without question, Aida. Uh, another one that I would say completely different, but also phenomenally large in scale would be uh, Boris Gudnov. 
uh, which is Russian. Um, Mussorgsky uh, composed it. But again, absolutely glorious music, um, extraordinary costumes, and just big, 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 big. So not all opera has to be that big. But if you just want to know what opera is like and you just want to be blown away by the experience, um, you can't go wrong with, with, with great productions of either of those. So, and again, if not, if they're not, uh, if, they're, if they're not happening in your area, I promise you that there are exceptional productions of both of them on YouTube. So as someone who is such an experience, when did you decide to move and do voice acting as, um, as well? I've done, I've, I, I still do voice acting and on camera acting as well. To me, acting is acting. It's just, mm. you know, you know, I <clears throat> listen, I'm a whore, Jeff, whatever the check is, <laughs> you understand? Acting is acting is acting is acting. So, um, you know, if it's if it's live theater, uh, if it's television, if it's film, if it's commercials, um, if it's radio, um, if it's, you know, whatever it is, um, that, that's a part of the job. And so you train to be able to do, you know, whatever the job requires, because that's that's how you're in your, your, your bones. So um, I had not planned on the career uh, in voice work that I ended up with. Um, when I first moved to Los Angeles um, a thousand years ago. <laughs> um, actually, 30 years ago, 31 years ago this year, um, I think. It was 1992, whatever the math is. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Carry the one. Yeah, 31 <laughs> years ago. Um, so, um, and, and, and even then, it was my fourth and final market because, uh, I, you know, I, I did... The Chicago thing, I did the Miami thing, I did the New York, you know, thing, and then I went back and did Chicago again, and did broadcasting in Chicago, in fact, for a year, um, television broadcasting, not radio, um, and then uh, ultimately decided I've had enough of that, and I always kind of sort of knew that LA was where I wanted to end up, and so I, I finally did the move, I came out here, um, and my uh, one of my agents knew uh, someone who had been a former client of hers years earlier, who now did uh, voice work, had a voice group that did voice work for feature films. And she made an introduction uh, for me uh, uh, with that person. And that person brought me in uh, to do a film, uh, to do some voice work on a film. And uh, we, we hit it off. And uh, she kept bringing me back and bringing me back. And then uh, I look up and it's however many decades later. And I look at this long, long list of voice work um, that I did in, you know, voice work in films as a result of, you know, that, that opportunity. So uh, I've been very grateful. It's kept the lights on, you know. Um, I have a voiceover agent. Uh, so I've also done like everything from video games to, as I said before, you know, radio commercials. Um, the only thing that I have not done is I haven't done um, books. I haven't done a, an audio book. Everybody tells me you should do an audio book. Um, but that opportunity hasn't presented itself yet. The, the right opportunity, I should say. So now, we'll see. I haven't looked at your IMDb page. There's a lot of credits for something called ADR Artist. What is that exactly? That's exactly the film voice work I'm talking about. So ADR stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement. And what, what that is, it can be a whole bunch of things. I'll break it down for you. So it's basically anything that um, happens in post-production sound after principal photography is shot. Um, say, for example, um, you're doing voice replacement of like a major character. And I've done God knows an awful lot of that. So um, I'll give you a great example. So remember the movie, The Fugitive? Yes. Harrison Ford? Yep. All right. So, uh, so in the opening sequence, or one of the opening sequences, so the, the, you know, he's a prisoner, right? And they're transporting them by train, and then the train derails, and he escapes into the bushes, right? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yep. Okay, so if you go back and you watch that, uh, so Harrison, you know, got, got out of the train, escaped, and is running through the bushes at night, to, to, you know, to get away, right? Yeah. And so what happens when you're running through the bushes? You, you breathe heavy, you know, you're like, <sighs> you know, you're running. Yeah. Right. It's impossible to run silently. You're <laughs> you're making noise. You're breathing heavily. Right. Right. Well, so um, 
they're not going to bring Harrison Ford back six months after the movie wrapped and he's on to his second or third project to just sit in a microphone in front of a microphone in the studio and breathe into the microphone <laughs> so that they get the sound of him breathing as he's running through the bushes. Yeah. So they're going to hire me to come in and, and breathe for Harrison. <laughs> so, so I'm going to do Harrison's voice effects. So I'm going to stand in front of a screen and a monitor in a sound booth, and I'm going to go, <sighs> and I'm going to, and I'm going to match my breath to what I'm seeing Harrison doing on the screen. And huzzah, I now have residuals for the rest of my life doing Harrison Ford's breathing in The Fugitive. You see what right. I'm saying? Right. <laughs> so that's, that's one example where you're basically, you're replacing, um, uh, you're, you're augmenting the sound on screen. Another example is where you'll do an off-screen character. Like, uh, so say the, uh, the scene, uh, the film is on, you know, the, 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 you're, you're watching the film and, the, and one of the characters turns the radio on and you hear the radio DJ. Well, obviously you never see the radio DJ, it's radio. Someone's got to do that voice. So they're going to hire you or me to come in and be the voice of the radio announcer, right? Mm. So that's another one. Uh, a third one is, um, and this happens uh, also sometimes, where you'll not only do effects to replace the character on screen, you'll also do um, actual replacement of lines. So they'll get in post-production and they'll say, okay, so um, we had the lead actor uh, or whatever in this scene, but something went wrong with the audio and they didn't catch it when they were in principal photography. So everyone is gone now and we're in post-production, but we've caught it and there's an audio glitch. Something happened, the sound dropped inexplicably or something was garbled or a plane flew overhead and we didn't catch it or something where the, the sound wasn't clear. So then they have to have someone come in because you're not going to hire, once again, if it's a Harrison Ford or someone, you're not going to spend the money to bring them to come in to pick up a line or two, right? Mm -hmm. So, and to reshoot a line or two. So you're going to hire someone who can do a, vo a vocal impression of them that's sufficient enough to get through, to, to redo their line and to do it close enough to the way they sound so that the audience doesn't say, oh, that's a whole nother person. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I, I didn't so, know that was a thing. <laughs> it's a total, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. So, uh, and, and I cannot begin to tell you how much of that vocal replacement work I've done as well. Um, where you just basically go in and, and sometimes in very pivotal scenes, you go in and you match someone as close as you possibly can. Uh, you match uh, your voice to theirs and uh, the audience never knows the difference if you've done your job properly and the line gets delivered and it looks like the actor on screen is saying it, but it was somebody else altogether and you oh. never know it. <laughs> um, another 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 um, form of ADR is uh, just w what they call group walla. So so like okay so you, so the characters the lead characters are in a, a, a crowded dining a crowded dining room okay or diner restaurant whatever. So there's going to be conversations in the background right because people are talking and they're dining and, and 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 whatever. But if you're shooting it on set, you can't have those conversations in the background because the possibility is that they're going to bleed into the dialogue of your main characters and you're not going to mm -hmm. hear what they're saying. So what happens is on set. Um, everyone is silent and pretending to talk mm -hmm. and the only, and the microphone only picks up the lead characters in the scene, uh, because they're the only ones actually talking. And so then later in post-production sound, what they'll do is they'll add the room conversation, but they'll add it at levels that they then can control to make sure that the principal characters are never, uh, you know, shouted over mm. or, 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 are never drowned out by the conversation. So um, any one of those is is considered ADR, basically, where you're coming in and and you're in post production sound, and you're replacing uh, with your voice, you're replacing you know some of the action that you see on screen. I had no idea any of that was an actual thing. That is amazing. Oh, it's huge. It's 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 huge. And there isn't a film out there that doesn't have it. There isn't a television show out there that doesn't need it. Um, because no, no, no on-camera principal photography is so clean that it doesn't need some sweetening in post-production. You know, so, even if it's even if it's an outside shot, you know, and and you know, uh, whatever, um, and the lead characters are outdoors and they're whatever. <clears throat> well, you still need to have the ambient sound of outdoors. 
Mm. So you need to have the folks across the street who are yelling at each other. You need to have uh, the sound of the neighbor uh, talking, you know, looking for their dog and calling. You need to have the sound of, and it's not just vocal tracks. You need to also have like, you know, the sound of that bus that just went by or the, the car that drove by or whatever. Those are sound effects which are added as well in post-production because you need the set to be as quiet as possible when you're shooting the principal photography so that the, so that the sound people can pick up the dialogue that they need to pick up but then you need to you need to like it's sort of like drawing this is a terrible analogy but it's the only thing i can come up with right now it's sort of like um you will you'll draw a, a painting of a person you know but then afterwards you get you'll, you'll draw it in, in pencil or an ink or whatever but then you need to come and you need to fill in the colors later mm. but you gotta get the outline first right so, so you basically get the bones and then you do the embellishment and you, you bring in the richness that makes it a three dimensional, but it's, it starts out as a one dimensional and that's just, you know, get the, get the sound of the, of the script of the dialogue from the principal performers. And then we add everything else later in post-production sound. That's how it's done. Oh, that's, that's very cool. Uh, so are you like naturally good at doing impression? That's why you can match your voice to these other actors so well. What a good question. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I would say, I would say, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an acquired skill, but it helps if you're a good mimic, uh, which I have a tendency to be, uh, it helps if you can do impressions, which I don't know that I would say that I'm particularly good at, but I can, I can fake anything for a few seconds. <laughs> um, you know, don't ask me to do an evening's worth of, of James Earl Jones, but I can give you a few seconds of it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Um, and there have been, uh, and it's, it's, it's come in handy um, an awful lot because, um, I mean, I've done people as varied as, uh, well, we talked about Harrison Ford. I've done, um, uh, I, I did John Candy in, in Cool Runnings. I did um, for like a snippet. I've done Tyler Perry and uh, Alex Cross and another one um, I've done. Uh, who else is fun? Oh, I did um, uh, Sean Connery in The Rock. Oh, wow. Um, which was fun, you know. So there's, <laughs> so there's, so there's, and, and, and again, all you need to do is for a little snippet. Um, and you, you match it as closely as you possibly can. I've done Morgan Freeman. Um, you know, I've done, I've done, um, uh, James Earl Jones. I think I mentioned, um, you know, obviously I've done a, a lot of the actors of color, but I've also done, you know, a lot of the, uh, I'll call them melanin challenged, <laughs> <laughs> melanin challenged actors as well. Because again, as long as you can get through a couple of snippets, it helps if, if you can do accents, which I can. Um, it helps if you have some some facility with language, which I do. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 great fun. And as I said, the beauty of it is that uh, we are all the, uh, members of the same um, actors union as the actors who perform on stage uh, on screen. Mm. So therefore, um, we get residual checks just like they do. Very cool. I mean, I still get residual checks for stuff that I did 30 years ago. Um, that was voice work then for a day. And I'm still getting, you know, I'm still getting those checks. I did um, Black Panther um, and love and, and enjoy those checks. And yet you will never see me in Black Panther. You'll just hear me and you'll be like, that was him. I didn't know that was him. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's not the best job in the world to have to do the voice work. Um, if your ego requires that, you know, you be easily, you know, recognizable. Mm. Um in fact, it's just sort of the opposite because your job is to blend. But but if you're looking just for the paycheck, and thankfully I'm at the stage of my career where I don't worry so much about my ego. I'm just worried about okay, what's the pay? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know that opportunity. You know when 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 those jobs come along, they they have a tendency to make themselves worth your worth your while, particularly if you've been doing it for a while. And in my case, I'm incredibly fortunate because I've been doing it for so long that I'm all, uh, in a lot of cases, I'm past the stage where I even need to audition. They just call and ask if I'm available, which is a lovely luxury to have that you don't have to prove yourself anymore. You know, you've, you've paid your dues, people know what you can do. Uh, and they just ask you, you know, to come in and do the work. 
And well, that's fine. In addition to the fact that I want to stress again, I still continue to work as an on-camera, on-stage performer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if anyone asks what I do, I just say I'm an actor, but that's, that could be a voice actor, that could be an on-stage actor, actor, that could be an on-camera actor, you know, acting is acting. So I do it all. Well, I think one of the coolest things I, I found about you is that uh, you voiced the Borg in Star Trek First Contact, which is one of my favorite movies, especially right. in science fiction. So how did you get involved with that? And can you do, are you able to do the voice a little bit? Yes and no. Okay. I can answer your question, but I don't do the voice. Okay. But I can explain to you why. Okay. Um, and when I do conventions, of course, that's the first question that everybody wants to do. Do the voice, do the voice, do the voice. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm not doing that. So, um, and there's a reason. So, so, so here's how, well, do you want the story of how we did it? Or do you want the story of how I got the job? Or do you want both? I got time for both. Okay. Well, then I'll start at the beginning and how I got the job. I got the job uh, because I was on, well, I got the job when I was on vacation. Actually, that's how it started. Um, I was on, I was on a little, little weekend getaway to Las Vegas. Um, and uh, my agent, uh, called and said, uh, I have a voiceover audition for you. And I said, well, I can't do it because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm on vacation. I'm in, I'm in Vegas. And she said, well, no, they'll, 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 they'll do a phone audition for you. You can just, um, go down to the concierge, I'll fax the script, um, go down to the concierge. Um, here's a number that you need to call at a certain time. Uh, they'll record the audition over the phone. And I'm like, okay, well, that's easy enough. That's fine. So I went down to the front desk, said, you guys supposedly have a fax for me or something, whatever they did. They gave it to me. I went up back to my room. I looked over the script a couple of times. I wasn't even, I wasn't even told what the project was. I was just told I have this voiceover gig um, and, 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 you know, whatever. And so I said, fine. Um, and then I called the number I was supposed to call at the time I was supposed to call. Um, told them who I was. I said, yes, we're expecting you. Um, they said, let us give us a, a minute to, to set it up. And I said, great. Uh, and then um, I did it. And then I went on with my little mini vacation. So about a month go, goes by and I'm back in Los Angeles and uh, my agent calls again. And she said, I have this voiceover uh, audition for you. And I said, great. And, and so she sends over uh, the script and I said, wait a second. I did this a month ago. If you remember, this was the one that I did back in, 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 in Vegas when I was on vacation. She said, no, I know, but this time they want you to do it um, live in person. They want you to go over to the Paramount lot and do it for the director. And I was like, great. Okay, sure. So I went, I went to the Paramount lot, um, <clears throat> went to the, to the, to the, to the studio that, you know, I was supposed to go to. And I met Jonathan Frakes who, of course, you know, um, Jonathan Frakes, or I assume you know, directed First Contact. Yep. But obviously, you know, you folks famously know him as Commander Riker. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jonathan said, yeah, I listened to your audition and I liked what you did. Um, but, and by then, I understood the fact that it was for Star Trek and that was how I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, but I want to talk to you about the character a little bit. I want to make some adjustments, if that's okay with you. And I'm like, sure, what do you? thinking so uh, we talked about how he wanted the voice to sound and um you know i i he, he gave me his thoughts I, I i gave him mine we chatted for a couple minutes and then he said okay you want to lay one down and i was like, sure so we're on the sound stage and there's an engineer in the booth and i'm um, standing up i've got the music stand in front of me with a little light on it with the script on the music stand and the microphone right there of uh, the overhead rather um and he said do you mind if we record it I said, of course not so he's standing next to me. Um, he says, when, and, and then he tells the engineer, start rolling. And he tells me whenever you're ready. And uh, so then I did, I read the script. And I did one take. And then after I did the take, um, uh, uh, I pause and he yells, he, he says, cut to the engineer. And then, and as I said, he's standing next to me the whole time. And so like, he really gets really loud and animated in my face. He goes, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, like, and imagine someone standing right next to you and then, you know, boom, you know, I don't know. Oh, hello. Slow your roll there, John. But, <laughs> and uh, he goes, that's it. That's perfect. That's exactly what I want. And I'm like, well, that's great. Um, um, so, uh, I can tell you and your audience that what you actually hear in the film is that audition take. Oh, wow. 
What we ended up doing to create the Borg effect, however, because if you recall, uh, the film came out in 1996. So they, uh, I, I've read um, places online where folks have speculated how they created the voice, and they're like, "Oh well, you know, it was done. It was done, you know, with the machine, and it was this, and it was that. It was digital and special effects. Yeah, none of that is true. What it was was literally uh, the notion that the Borg is a collective, right? So um, that means that there are <clears throat> um, that there are separate Borgs, but th that they work sort of um, as, as a collective. There's no other word for it. Um, and so what we did was we thought, OK, well, so Borgs are going to be pretty close, but not identical. So the theory behind how to create the, the sound of the voice was, say, for example, um, I give you a script, Jeff, and I say, yeah. OK, read this sentence, right? And so you read the sentence and we record it. I say, OK, now read it again and we're going to record it again and try to sound as close as, as you did. Try to sound as close as you can to the first thing you did. Mm. And you're going to do that. But because we are human, it's not going to be perfect. Mm. It's going to be slightly different. And I'm going to say, well, do it again, Jeff. And again, you're going to try to be as precise as you can be. And once again, because we're human, it's going to be slightly different. Well, that's perfect for what we were trying to create with the Borg. So what we did to create the Borg voice that you hear in the film is we did that. I, we spent an afternoon of me just reading the lines over and over and over again, trying to sound exactly like I did from the audition take. But because I am human, having there be just enough differences to create the sound that you hear in the film. And mm. to sweeten it up a little bit more to give it a little season, um, they did one take that was another actor altogether, not myself. And then they did another take that was a female actor doing the same thing. Both of them also listening in headset to the audition take that I did to try to get as close to it as possible. Just to sort of, once again, you know, like flesh it out and, you know, give it some color. So I would say that what you end up hearing in the film is the result of like 20 to 25 takes that were literally layered right on top of each other as though you were building a cake. <laughs> that's awesome, son. I never knew that's how they did it. I always, that, I always thought it was filtered through a uh, computer. That's why everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks it was, again, 1996. They weren't that fancy. There was no computer. You know? <laughs> um, and that's why uh, folks have, who have tried to replicate it since have never gotten the exact effect because, you know, unless you have individual takes layered on top of each other and all you and, and, and you, you just have like a voice synthesizing machine or something you're never going to get that same effect so that's the secret so now i'll never work again because <laughs> i have now <laughs> i have now i have now told you how how it was done but that's also why i don't ever um uh indulge folks who ask me to do it because unless you're going to have me do it 20 times on top of each other it's not going to sound the same <laughs> <laughs> so so you're going to be bitterly disappointed and i'm going to be profoundly annoyed so so, <laughs> so I, I i direct people to um several places on youtube once again it sounds like i've been i i've been hawking youtube a lot this conversation <laughs> did they owe but, you a bit <laughs> uh, they I, i'm looking for a check i'm going to tell you now um <laughs> but there are uh tons of uh clips of it on uh youtube and there's one um, in particular that I always uh, direct people to. Um, and I think it's called uh, Resistance is Futile um, Borg, Voice of the Borg or something. And it's like a one minute montage. And it, basically it does the entire movie in one minute in case you have short attention span. <laughs> um, and it ends with the Borg voice. So, mm. um, and, 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 and that's how you... That's how you get it. Now, can I ask you a question? Sure. Great. So now you remember the movie, and I assume you remember the, that 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 Borg voice. Yes. Did you see it for the first time, like at home on DVD, or did you see it in a movie theater? I believe it was movie theater. All right. Do you remember how you felt when you heard it? Mm, I'm trying to remember that was a long while ago, but I remember uh -huh. just loving it though. <laughs> All right, but no, but no, like immediate reaction that you that you recall, no sort of. I, I, I no, I, I immediately felt it was intimidating. Okay. 
All right, that's cool. That's what we were kind of going for. But we were trying to go, we were trying to go for um, intimidating um, and scary, but not, but not menacing. Mm. You know, I did we didn't want to do ah, 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 because nobody cares, right? right. Um, the, the whole the whole thing that 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 Jonathan was looking for was, you know, I don't have to the Borg doesn't have to try to intimidate you because the Borg is inherently intimidating. You know, the Borg doesn't care if you're afraid of it because your fear is irrelevant, <laughs> you know, because yeah. what's going to happen is going to happen. So, you know, if you've got that sort of overwhelming might, and overwhelming power, you don't need to, you don't, you know, you don't need to work at impressing someone that you have it. You don't really care because mm. whatever you want to happen is what you think is inevitably going to happen. So there, there was that sort of, and plus you're not human. So there was that factor of how can we make this scary and intimidating, but not overtly men menacing. Mm. Um, and in fact, the more matter of fact you make it, the scarier it becomes. Mm. So if you go back and you listen to it, um, you'll see that the read was not a menacing read. It was almost a, we are just going to take over and, you know, deal. <laughs> well, and, and that's what made it scary. The fact well, that it was like so confident that what they wanted to happen was actually going to happen. Well, what's actually pretty cool right now is that I'm going through the Star Trek movies with my wife. Okay. And we're just started Star Trek Generation. So the next movie up, she'll be, she'll be seeing First Contact for the first time. So I'm very curious how that's going to play out. Oh, I'm, I, I send me a note. I'd love to hear it. I totally will. Like, uh, I'm, I'm very excited. First time she started becoming a Trekkie. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, I, I see you've had some influence. Yes. <laughs> um, which is good because, you know, congratulations on being a, a husband who still has influence with his wife. Right. <laughs> this must be a relatively new marriage because that's not going to last. Uh <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're on uh, four years. Well, it's, uh, OK, there you go. So you're about to graduate, <laughs> in other words. So um, congratulations on that. Thank you. No, uh, it's it's um, it, it, it it's been good for me. It's been a lovely, um, a lovely job. Uh, it's been a lovely, you know, couple of decades since we did it. Um, and it's the thing that has enabled me to go to a whole bunch of Star Trek conventions that I would not have otherwise, no one would have cared, you know, so it's very cool. I, um, I, I was, I think, I think it's really cool about the Star Trek fan base is that what, uh, whichever part you've been in Star Trek, the fan base always embraces you completely. They're charming. Listen, they're charming. Uh, and I will, and I will confess to you that when I, you know, when I was a kid, Star Trek was my jam, you know? <laughs> Yeah. The original series, I was all about it. So um, it was lovely to, I mean, it was lovely to finally have an opportunity to become a part of it, um, you know, um, which I thought was just the coolest thing ever. Um, and, and now the older I get, I, I've come to realize that, that I sort of have a unique position in the, in the Star Trek firmament. Mm. Because I, I tell folks um, who, who don't know, I'm like, so there are basically there are three phrases that sort of uh, have entered the, the zeitgeist, as it were, and uh, they are familiar to folks who are, who are not even familiar with the Star Trek oeuvre. I just use mm. zeitgeist and oeuvre in a sentence together. <laughs> well done. I'll never make that mistake again. But you're an English teacher, so sure to be very proud of me right now. I am. Um, well done. But uh, thank you so much. Again, I'll bill you separately. But um. <laughs> Um, and, and, and so there are three phrases that even if you're not a Trekkie or Trekker or Trek fan, you know, the, free, the three phrases, of course, you know, one of them is, uh, you know, beam me up, Scotty, which, of course, no one ever really said. Yep. Um, and the other one is, of course, live long and prosper, which yep. was Leonard's. And if you don't know the story of how Leonard came up with it, and if your audience doesn't know, I encourage them to look it up. It is a fascinating story. Um, and and, and it, there's this wonderful video. There was this interview that Leonard did years later um, for, I want to say, um, uh KCAL, I think it was, which is like the, the Channel 9 affiliate in Los Angeles. Uh, he was uh, he was also an artist and he came and uh, he got interviewed and he told the reporter, he's probably done it before, but this is the one that I saw. He told the reporter how, you know, Live Long and Prosper came about and it's fascinating. I had no idea that was how it was done. So that's super cool. And then, of course, you know, the third and final one is Resistance is Futile, which everybody mm. kind of sort of knows and attributes to me because I did the film. 
now now for the true folks uh, who are true fans of, of trek they'll be the first ones to tell you that i did that i did not originate my character's interpretation the borg did not originate the phrase resistance is futile um it was actually done in the t in, in in the next gen series before the film came out mm -hmm. a couple of times and and a lot of folks will know that but um it was like a throwaway at the time um, and it wasn't until First Contact came along and actually made Resistance is Futile the tagline um, to, the, to the film that uh, the phrase kind of sort of blew up. Um, and since I'm the person that voiced it for the film, you know, I, I sort of backed into that delicious gift um, that, I, that it happened, you know, that it was around before me, but I get to sort of take credit for the moment that made it big so so when you're what are the convention experience like when they come to you or, or is it are they older generation they newer generation kids you know what i love about it it's a cross section um and i started to say before that i um you know uh before i ever went to a trek convention i i knew the rap of trek conventions you know there's going to be a whole bunch of you know strange bizarre you know weird <laughs> nerdy folks who live in their mom's basement kind of do <laughs> um because that's the rap right yep. and then you go there and you find out that nothing could be further from the truth they are the sweetest most genuine oftentimes smartest funniest most charming folk you're going to meet and they're absolutely lovely once they meet you you know mm. and spend a little bit of time with you there i've come to i've come to realize all Trek is, is it's a, you know, for these folks, is it's a hobby. Stamp collecting is a hobby for some folks. Gun collecting is a hobby for other folks. Whatever your hobby is. And this is their hobby. And, you know, that's all. And, and, and you can't sort of, you know, make rash generalizations about the kind of people because they are literally a panoply of, of, of uh, a cross section of, of humanity um, mm. and not just locally, but internationally. I've met, I've met folks from, um, you know, uh, every continent at Trek conventions. I've met folks from every state at Trek conventions. Um, and it's, 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 it's a delight. And sometimes uh, some of these folk um, you see year after year, time after time, and some of them have actually become personal friends. Very cool. So I uh, listen. I I mean I'm I am grateful for everything that you know uh, that this genre has given me and everything that uh, you know its fans have done for me. It's been a lovely experience. I don't have a downside. Um, I, if I did, I'd tell you. Because I'm old enough, I don't care. <laughs> I'm old enough that I don't have to lie to anybody. I don't owe anybody any money, so I can tell you the truth. But it has, but there have been no downsides. It's actually just been um, a, a charming experience um, and one that I'm very grateful for. And oddly enough, um, uh, given the nature of my career, um, with its uh, roller coaster and its you know peaks and its valleys. It's been one of those uh, highlights that, um, you know, that, that has, that has, it's the gift that keeps on giving, I guess I should say. So, yeah. I, I think that's fantastic. And I, and I, you know, talking about as, as a hobby, I think if you're going to have one, the ideals of Star Trek is a great one to have. Listen, are you, you're not going to get any argument from me. Right. Um, you're not going to get any argument from me. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, um, as I said, to be part of it. I am hopeful, uh, frankly, uh, to do more because, you know, there's a whole bunch of new series out. Yep. Um, and, um, you know, they need to dust off my character or give me a new one. Yeah. Um, if anybody out there is listening, you know, hit, hit up my agent. <laughs> um, cause I, I, I want to, I want to do some more Trek. Um, um, and here's another sidebar. Um, I'm also. And I hope this is not sacrilegious to say, to confess, um, but I'm also a huge Star Wars fan. Mm. And in fact, have also done work uh, on that franchise as well. So I'm one of the handful of actors out there who's worked on both Star Wars and Star Trek. And I couldn't be happier about that. Um, Star Wars, Star Trek, and Spider-Man, I've done. <laughs> um, and it's kind of cool because all three of those are incredibly ridiculously popular franchises yeah and how lucky am i that you know i'm a part of all three of them in addition to all the other stuff i've done so i can't complain listen i'd look like an idiot if i complained are you kidding me <laughs> well so. the, the other great thing about them is that 
no matter how long it's been that you've done it, people always feel like it's something that you've just done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, like you asked me how old the folks at conventions are, um, you know, you get everybody from eight to 80, literally, you know, and you wonder like how the eight year olds know the work and it's how you done it with your wife you know it's like the the folks who know introduce the folks who don't yep you know grandpa says you got to check out star trek <laughs> you know um um husband says to wife you got to check out star trek well so so you guys you guys keep keep it alive and to your credit you do and you know f- folks like on my end are grateful for that certainly grateful that you do well so thank you well, for me, it was um, my dad who introduced me to Star Trek. He was the original series, watched the original series, watched sure. the original movie. It was my father. Sure. And then, obviously, I'm, I'm moving it on to my wife. <laughs> right, 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 right. It, it's how it goes. It goes through a family line. Yeah, as it should. Listen, you know, it's a legacy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a legacy. And, 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 and my mom, who introduced me to it, I, I got to tell you, when I got the gig, um uh she was over the moon she was like i guess you know that i have some responsibility for this i'm like, <laughs> I'm like if you want to take credit just knock yourself out that's great you know <laughs> so now i um yeah um truly honored and as i said want to do more so um with luck uh we'll see who knows maybe you'll have me on um some other time when something else happens that are that's for me that, that becomes star trek related that'd be fun I think it's I think it's time that I dust this one off or do something do something new in the genre. So uh, that that would be fun. Well, if you look at it, well, post on the interview link will be your website so they can find you and hope that'd, that. be, that'd be absolutely awesome. Yeah, I could do that. I could do that. Um, um, I've got some friends who are in some of the new series, uh, some oh. very close friends, in fact, who are members of the new series. So I haven't I haven't campaigned because that's really not really my style. But hey, it's the new year, so maybe I'll just start campaigning a little bit. Well, that'd be fantastic. And like I said, I'd be glad to talk about that. Anyone who knows my podcast knows we talk about, we have Star Trek people on yep. uh, regularly. <laughs> well, there you go, right? Right. I did. I checked it out. You've had everybody. I've had, I had a pretty good group so far. You've had, how many, <laughs> how many years? How long have you been doing this? Um, this show has been 14 months. It seems longer. That it, uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. Cootwood. You've been absolutely fantastic. And like I said, anytime you want to come back on the show, the door's always open for you. Well, that's very kind of you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Best of luck uh, to you and your podcast. Thank you. Uh, to your listeners. Hope we meet uh, face-to-face at some point. And uh, drop me a note and let me know what your wife thinks when she sees the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, Jeff. Thanks again. You as well. Bye-bye.